Let us pray. Our dear Holy Fathers, we come before you today. We pray your spirit would be upon us. He would move in our hearts and minds. Lord, that he would be heavy upon us. We rebuke the enemy as he tries to lie to us, as he tries to hide the words of Christ from us. So we pray, Lord, that Christ would break through. Teach us your word that we may know you more. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, in the infinite past, the Lord God looked upon this vast expanse of nothingness. And he decided to create. As a painter to a canvas, God spoke. His words resonated throughout the vastness of this emptiness that was nothing and it became something. The universe began to form. Order and stability could be seen. The universe with all its stars, galaxies, nebulae, gases, quasars, they all moved into position. Then God focused his attention on earth. This is where he would focus his attention. This is where he would painstakingly carve, create, imagine, love, and interact. This would be his most important work. In Genesis 1, it says God created the heavens and the earth. Before the beginning, God existed. Then he created. God, who is triune, has existed in relationship from eternity past to eternity future. He created. And when he created, there was no committee, there was no government discussion, no petition, no board, no bureaucracy, no environmental impact study, no license to build. God created. He is in control. He orchestrated. He touched. He spoke. He imagined. He wanted life. He wanted beauty. He wanted color. He wanted movement, motion, gravity, sunlight, mountains, valley, animals, rivers, lakes, and oceans. He wanted his creatures to have eyes so they could see the beauty of color, leaves changing, mountains majestically standing. He wanted his creatures to hear the sounds of the river flowing, the rain falling, people laughing, the sounds of animals, the sweet melody of music and instruments. He wanted his creatures to feel. To feel the wind gently blowing, the soft fur of an animal the gentle fragrance of a petal, the joy of a new day, the celebration of his creation. So God created. And when God created Adam from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils, Adam became a living being, a human being. And Adam stood, and I believe he spoke when he stood. He stood looking at the creation of God. He looked at himself He understood his role. He understood his place. He understood what he was looking at. And he understood the gift of life and the the gift of creation. And I believe he spoke. And I believe the first words out of his mouth were, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise because of your enemies. To silence the foe. And the avenger. When I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you're mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all his flocks and herds and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Adam worshiped. I believe he worshiped. He worshiped because God created and God gave him life. God placed him in the garden. God gave him a wife and God exposed him to all of the creative genius that he had made. And he worshiped. God caused all the animals to walk before him. He named them and Adam worshiped. It was the first words out of his mouth. And in Revelation, in the book of Revelation, it's the last things that we do as we worship God for all eternity. 
We begin with worship, we stay in worship, and we continue on forever in worship. But then worship stopped because Adam and his wife sinned, eating from the tree. Worship stopped. Evil grew and the curse of sin infected everything. The darkness of sin spread and death was introduced. God sent Adam and his wife out of the garden, out of what he had given him. They were unwelcome. Sin was found in their heart, their marriage, their decisions, and their lives. But when God saw Adam and his wife, he promised them hope. God wanted his people to know this was not the end of their story. This is not the end of your story either. Sin is not the end. Sin does not get the final say. Death does not get the final say. God promised by cursing the snake in Genesis 3, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers, and he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. This Christmas, we celebrate the crushing of the head of the snake. But we remember the striking of the heel on Christ. We celebrate the victory of Christ, but recognize the danger. In Romans 16, we read this. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. We get to join Christ in crushing the enemy. In crushing Satan. I want you to know today, Christ has overcome. Jesus said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. Christ has overcome. What does this mean we crush Satan under our feet? Well, Scripture describes Satan as the adversary. He's constantly looking for fault and looking to deceive. He uses people to manipulate each other. He uses kings, rulers, leaders uh, to lead entire people astray from God. We know in Zechariah chapter 3, we see Satan, the accuser, accusing Joshua The high priest saying, he's worthless, he's no good. He is the accuser. Christ called Satan a murderer and the father of lies. Satan's native tongue is lying. Paul said, Satan masquerades as an angel of light. Paul commanded us to put on the armor of God so we can stand against the devil's schemes. We read in Revelation 12 of the great red dragon standing before the woman about to give birth to Christ, waiting to devour the child, waiting to destroy Christ, waiting to destroy his people. And in that chapter, we see the conflict between the people of God and the dragon who's controlling the worldly powers and influencing the worldly powers. We see the battle that has raged on throughout the centuries between God's people and the satanic schemes. And what we see is that the enemy is denied, defeated, and best of all, he is not strong enough. He is not strong enough. The enemy is crushed because he's defeated and he's not strong enough. His lies are lies and not the truth. He deceives, deceives, but Christ is the truth. He manipulates, he divides, he divides, he whispers, he maneuvers, but Christ is our hope. The enemy will tell you that you are no good. You're sinful and you should just get rid of yourself. Just kill yourself. That's what he'll tell you. Or he'll tell you you're the best thing there is since sliced bread. You're the best there is. You're so great. You're so worthy. Either way, it's to keep you from knowing the truth. And the truth is Christ. That is what we get to crush. We get to reveal the lies that we hear. That maybe we have even obeyed and listened to. We get to remove the lies. Overcome the deceptions. Destroy the manipulation. And walk in freedom of the truth. We get to go to others who have been lied to. Deceived and manipulated. And free them in Christ. And say walk in the truth. Don't listen to him. We get to show them the baby in the manger, the man on the cross, and the God who loves us. We get to show them that they're worthy of God's love. And those who are beaten down, left to die by the world, 
say, let me show you the beauty and the freedom and the joy of Jesus Christ. Or maybe we get to go to those who are so filled with pride that they think they're so great and say, you know, you're not. That is a lie. That is crushing Satan. Giving truth to people. Because Christ has overcome. You have been lied to because the enemy lies. You have been lied to because that is what the enemy does. But you have been redeemed because that is who Christ is. Maybe you've been told you're the best thing since sliced bread, but you're not. Maybe you've been told you're worthless. You're not. Maybe you've been told that your sins are too great, that God cannot forgive you, that, you, that everything you've done is just too much. You are forgiven. Maybe you're told that you shouldn't forgive, you shouldn't reconcile, you shouldn't trust, you shouldn't love. You can. Because that is who Christ is. Rob Reamer in his book, I may have mentioned this before, in his book Soul Care, Soul Care said, My value was settled at the cross. My value. God, our creator, walked in the garden. He searched for his creation among the trees. He called out to them, and sadly, he found them with sin in their heart. So he exiled them, but with a promise and hope. He would find them, and he would bring them back to him. His people will be in his presence again. He promised to send Christ to crush the serpent and Christ has come and he has overcome. Well, today I want to look at three major truths that we can know each day about Christ. That we can live in the reality of them each day and give to others each day. Christ is the one who has come, who walked among us, who is the manifestation of love. And at the same time, who has overcome. First thing, Christ will forgive you. Christ will forgive you. You know, when God saw Adam and his wife with sin in their heart, he cast them out. But his love for them was not gone. His holiness is too much for them. It's too much for us. The holiness of God is dangerous to us. His holiness is though is what we need. What we lack because of sin is righteousness. Christ is what we need. Christ is that righteousness. You know, when the angel appeared to Joseph in a dream in Matthew 1, he said to name him Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. Our most important need is God and our most important endeavor is to know God. God desires for you to know him. But as the book of Habakkuk said, his eyes are too pure to look on evil. He must remove our sins so we can come into his midst. He wants you to come into his presence. We can know his presence and he, we can know him living among us. Christ is the presence of God and the presence of God is our future. It has always been the will of God for God to be in the presence of his people. He desires you to be in his presence. Well, a British pastor named Matthew Hosier, I think his name is, writes about a missionary friend who moved to a Muslim majority nation. And when they first moved to the Middle East, they heard that on a festival days, everybody dresses uh, in their best clothes and goes to visit their relatives and neighbors to celebrate. So for their first, this first festival day, they carefully cleaned their apartment, dressed up in their best clothes, got some sweets and chocolates, which are tradi- traditional to hand out, and waited in the house. But no one came. <laughs> well, another missionary explained what they had done wrong. You see, on festival days, the small visit the big. In other words, if the family goes to visit, they go to visit the older brother, their parents or grandparents. And when they arrive, they would kiss the hand of the older person to show respect and honor. 
they would host, the host would then give out gifts of candy or money or some other present. And the host would care for them. They would feed them. They would serve them. And as a newly arrived foreigners into this country, the so, their social standing and the fact that they had no relatives, they were considered small. <laughs> so they weren't going to be visited. Well, this incident made this missionary ponder the awesomeness of God's incarnation. In every religion, human beings, the small, try to visit God by their own strength and their own good works. But as much as we try to dress up nicely, we cannot be clean enough. We can't be righteous enough to go into God's house. And so when we think of Christ coming to this earth, God, Christ, was both the small and the big. He humbled himself totally he, to become the small. So that we could, so that he could visit us in our house, in our sinful house. But also he played the big so that he could give us gifts, the Holy Spirit, atonement and clean clothes. Which means we are now appropriately dressed and we can walk into the presence of God. Christ did that. He gave us that. He poured his righteousness on us. God came to visit. He walked among us. He came to live with us. In John 1, 14, we read this. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. But in order for us to live with him, he desires to live with us that we have to be forgiven. Our sins have to be removed. And in Romans 5, we read these words. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. You look at those verses in Romans 5. We have been justified, it says. We have peace with God. The word justified means we have been made righteous. God has poured his righteousness into us. And that means we have peace with God and we have gained permission to stand before the holy and loving God. We can visit him. We can dwell with him. We can worship him. We are made righteous by him. We are set right. We are made new. We, Christ has poured himself into us. As Christ was on the cross, he cried out, it is finished. That means the sin price was paid in full. The punishment and wrath that we deserved was removed. That is why we have peace with him. The baby in the manger, through his death on the cross, has forgiven our sins and given us his righteousness. Christ will forgive you. The enemy will lie to you, though. He will do what he can and belittle you and mock you and laugh at you and tell you Christ did nothing. He will tell you the Bible's made up. Jesus never existed. His death and resurrection, they're all fairy tales. But I'm here to tell you the enemy is crushed and he has no authority because Christ has overcome. Christ has overcome. Number two, Christ will include you. The baby in the manger is God's son. He is God. He is Lord. He is with us. Because Christ has forgiven us, he will include you into his family. He will invite you into his presence. In Romans 8, Paul writes this. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. The enemy will always lie to you. And the one lie that he pinpoints, that he centers on, the one that he majors on, the biggest lie that he can tell you, that he can deceive you, is your identity. Because he knows that what you know about yourself will affect how you live, what choices you make, what priorities you will have, and how you will interact with one another. So who you are is the enemy's biggest target. 
It is also our most vulnerable area. These verses in Romans 8 speaks to you about your identity. If Christ is your Lord, then this is who you are in Romans chapter 8 there. If Christ is not your Lord, then this is what Christ is offering you. He removes our fear. He makes you his own, a member of the family. Because of that, you can enter in his presence and you can cry out to him, Daddy. You can say, God, you are my papa, my daddy, my father. And he will pick you up and hold you close because you belong to him. This is who you are in Romans 8. You are forgiven. You are a new creation. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are delivered. You are redeemed. You are holy. You are victorious. You are set free. You are strong. You are reconciled. You are dead to sin. You are more than a conqueror. You are a co-heir. You are accepted. Because you belong to Christ, you are a co-heir of Christ. I don't know if you capture the amazing and immensity of that statement, a co-heir of Christ. That means what Christ has, you have. What relationship the Christ has with the Father, that's the relationship you have. This is who you are. If you are God's child, then who you are will affect how you live. What choices you make. What kind of relationships you have. How you interact with one another. What priorities will you have? Since you are God's child through Christ, how will you live? If you are a co-heir with Christ, what will you pursue? You know, it's interesting in John 4. Jesus is talking to the woman at the well in Samaria. And when the disciples saw him talking to her, they didn't say anything. But the woman leaves. And so the disciples said, Rabbi, eat something. Then the Lord says, I have food that you know nothing about. Then he explained what he meant. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. In other words, that is what energized Christ. This is what compelled him. This is what got him up every morning. What can I do to fulfill my father's will? What can I do to fulfill my father's will? Is that what you're saying when you get up in the morning? This is what I want to fulfill God's will. Whatever it is. Does that energize you? I hope so. Because remember, Christ is overcome. Number three, Christ will give you certainty. In an uncertain world, he is our foundation. When values are uncertain... When justice is uncertain, when people are uncertain, when relationships are uncertain, Christ is our certainty. You know, we've seen a lot of tragic events in just the past few years. But there's always a few flashes of hope that come forth from these stories of tragedies. There's an interesting story, sad and yet happy, about one of the survivors of the 2015 San Bernardino, San Bernardino shootings. A 27-year-old Denise Peraza tells this story. She says that her life was spared, not because the shooter looked at her and turned away and walked away. is because of another man, a valiant man named Shannon Johnson, who literally shielded her body as, as bullets were raining. She says that it was Wednesday morning at 10.55 a.m. They were seated next to each other at a table. Joking about how they thought that large clock was moving so slow because, you know, just time was going (laughs) just so slow. Well, five minutes later, they'd be huddled next to each other under the same table, using it as a shield as over 60 bullets were coming toward them. And she says, while I cannot recall every single second that played out that morning, I will always remember his left arm wrapped around me, holding me as close as possible next to him behind that chair. And amidst all the chaos, I always remember him saying these three words, I got you. Always, no matter what, remember these three words, I got you. 
These are God's three words to you. You know that? Not just in times of needs, but all time. He is, our, your, he is your everlasting father through the Lord Jesus Christ who does not leave you nor forsake you. And he says to you, I got you. I got you. I got you. You know, as Christ was on the cross, this baby born in a major who grew to be a man, <clears throat> he was arrested and sentenced to death. He was forced to carry the cross. He withstood flogging, meaning he was whipped almost to death. He was bleeding out. He was dying an excruciatingly painful death. He, nails were driven into his hands and feet. He was a laughing stock. He was used as a deterrent to say, don't do what he did. He was humiliated. He was insulted. He bled. But the most painful thing that he endured that day was not the physical pain. It was the sin that was placed upon him. Sin fell upon him. The weight was unbearable. The searing, disgusting, and foul-smelling sin invaded his soul, his heart, and his cells. He became sin. But what happens when you put sin on Christ who is holy? When you put all that foul-smelling Horrible sin on the holiness of Christ. Sin dies. Sin doesn't have a chance. Sin dies. When you put sin on Christ who's clean, pure, righteous, holy, sin cannot corrupt. Sin is destroyed. Sin is overcome. Sin is defeated because sin has got no answer. That means all the lies, deception, manipulation of the enemy is defeated. Christ is overcome. And then he rose again. Why? Because because death cannot hold on to him. That is the certainty of Christ. And that is what we know is true. In John 14, we read these words. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. That is the truth. That is the certainty we look forward to. That is the promise and the hope that we know and the future that we can hold on to. That is our certainty. Christ is coming again. Yes, clap it up. (laughs) So in the latter, it's interesting, in the latter chapters of Exodus, God told the Israelites to build a tabernacle, a tent for God. And the reason why is clear. In Exodus 24, 9, it says, Then I will dwell among the Israelites and be their God. In Leviticus 26, in his, in his whole book on holiness, God commands his people to follow the demands of holiness, and the result will be his presence. In 26, 11, it says, I will be, put my dwelling place among you, and I will not abhor you. That's nice, huh? I will walk among them and be your God and you will be my people. You see, this is God's will. This is God's heart. This is what he wants. He wants to be among his people. It's echoed and repeated in the prophets. It's declared by the psalmist. It's revealed and fulfilled in the New Testament. It is the heartbeat of the Bible. It is the heartbeat of God. I want to live with my people. The truth is, is God is moving history toward this end. And Christ has fulfilled it. God is with us. Christ, the baby in the manger, is God who became flesh so that we could dwell with him. In Zephaniah 3, the promise of God is the truth and the future reality of who God is that we now know. And we read this. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Isn't that precious? God among us. Christ is overcome. And finally, what will be your response? In Matthew chapter 2, we read this. Matthew chapter 2, starting with verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, 
Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where's the one who's been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief, people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them, Where is the Christ was to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, For this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Matthew 2, we see three responses to Christ our Lord. In Matthew 2, we're told that Jesus is born in Bethlehem, and these magi from the east have come to worship him. Now, these magi are probably astrologers or astronomers. They're stargazers. They're not kings. They were advisors to kings. Uh, The Jews had been living there for close to 700 years in Babylon. And so they probably learned from these Jewish people about this Messiah coming. And they would look at the stars and they studied the stars and they developed these sophisticated calendars. And then they saw this particular star and it was an amazing star. And they knew that this star meant the Messiah was born. So they would naturally go to Jerusalem because isn't that where kings are born? And they would naturally go to Herod because isn't he the ruler at the time? Well, this would have taken several months to travel from Babylon to Jerusalem. They traveled to worship the true and living king, the king of kings. They were intent on worshiping Christ. When they found him, they bowed down before him and they gave him gifts. These gifts are fitting for the king of kings. Then there is Herod, who is called the Great. When Magi came to visit him and tell him, where's the one born king of the Jews? It says he in all of Jerusalem was disturbed. He is a paranoid man. He is suspicious of everyone, he, even of his own sons and wives. He had several wives. He even killed one because he thought they were too close to the throne. And even one of his kids. He was a paranoid man. And so when the Magi come to Herod and say, where's the one born king of the Jews? That was not a smart thing to do. Because Herod, when he heard this news, he was intent on killing him, on killing Christ. And then there are the chief priests and teachers of the law. When Herod came to visit them and he asked where the Messiah is to be born, the teacher of the law told him, well, it's in Bethlehem because of the book of Micah, chapter 5, verse 2, tells us where Christ is to be born. And then they did nothing else. They did not inquire. Why is Herod asking? They just sort of quietly disappeared from the rest of the chapter. You'd think they would say, I wonder what he's asking for. Did he hear something we haven't? Their intent in keeping the status quo and staying comfortable, laying low and passively forgetting what Herod had asked. What is your response? Are you intent on destroying Christ like Herod? Are you passively forgetting him and saying, we don't need to worry? Are you intent on bowing your knee and worshiping Christ our Lord? I invite you to worship him today. Because Christ has overcome. Let's pray. Father God. I can't praise you enough or thank you enough for the amazing gift of Christ our Lord. I pray, Lord, that each person here will know who they are because of Christ and they will worship you. And that, Lord, our response will be, Lord, you are Lord. 
I am not. And I worship you. So Lord, I pray that you touch hearts here today, that they would give their lives to you. 